a kid I got some phone calls I've been avoiding Some family members I don't really connect with Some things I've said I wish I could
Edwin's here. <clears throat> hey, Kim. Hey, Kim. Good. How are you? Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to Bartram Baptist Church. We're so thankful that you're here with us today. It is uh, somewhat obvious that today is a special day. And uh, so we praise God for that. The Lord is risen, and He's risen indeed. Amen? Amen. He has. That's a reason for us to be excited, because that's, that's our proof that one day we'll rise again as well. Amen. And we'll be with Him. Oh, and He's coming back, and coming back soon. I don't know about you, but I can see the signs everywhere. It is not long. It is not far off. If you're a guest here, we want to say welcome. Thank you uh, for being here. You may find a card like this in front of you in the pew. This just gives you a little bit of information about the church. Uh, and on the back side, it talks about how to become a Christian and how to join the church. Actually, how to join the church is a question I get pretty frequently. You might be surprised by that, but uh, it is. And so there's the answers on the back of that. Uh, God has been blessing, and we've been seeing our church grow some, and we just pray that he continues to build his church and grow his church and his ministry, because uh, if you ask me, it's all his, and it's all about him. Yep. Amen. Amen. All right. 
Also, if you're a guest, you'll see a card like this in front of you, uh, probably in the back of the pews there. Uh, if you wouldn't mind filling that out so we can have a record of you, uh, that would be great. Your attendance here, uh, that would be wonderful. You can just leave it right in the pew where you're sitting, or you could put it in one of the offering plates that's on a few of our pews out there. Uh, we don't pass those, uh, but if you have uh, something that you'd like to let us know, a prayer request, uh, one of these cards, uh, if you see one of our envelopes around and you want to give and support God's ministry here, that's where all of that will go, right in those offering plates there, and we just praise the Lord for that. All right, I've got some other announcements we're going to wait until the end of the service today to do uh, because we have what we call today a, a children's Easter parade, and I don't see any children, uh, well, there might be some, so I don't know if you want your children to participate or not. It's not too late to let them kind of make their way to the back hallway. They're going to come through. They're going to stand here uh, and uh, individually or together as siblings, whatever the case might be, and we've got uh, someone taking pictures for us this morning. So we'll make sure to make those available. But if you want to have your child involved in that, uh, please know you can do that before we get started. All right. Also, um, I understand that there are some little white eggs hidden around the church. And they have Bible verses in them. And the idea behind that is take those with you wherever you go today and leave those for someone to find that. Hopefully open it up and find a Bible verse. Pretty neat. So... We want to give God all the glory. All right. Well, without any further ado, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll have our uh, Easter parade. Father, we just humbly approach your throne of grace once again this morning, thanking you for the Lord Jesus Christ, thanking you that we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that he is bodily risen from the dead, uh, conquering death, hell, and the grave, and paying for our sin debt, Lord. We thank you so much, and turning around and offering to everyone the free gift of eternal life that they might know that they'll go to heaven when they pass away one day. Father, we praise you. We thank you for that. We ask now, Lord, that you might bless this service for your honor and your glory. Have your will and your way. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Avenue. The photographers will snap us, and you'll find that you're in the road of gravure. I could write a sonnet about your Easter bonnet and of the girl I'm taking to the Easter. In your Easter 
everybody With all the frills upon it You'll be the grandest lady In the Easter parade I'll be all in clover When they look you over I'll be the proudest fella In the Easter parade On the avenue Fifth Avenue The photographers will snap her And you'll find that you're In the road to grab I could write a sonnet About your Easter barter And of the girl I'm taking To the Easter Amen. Yes, give the Lord a round of praise offering. Amen. Aren't they precious? Man, Lord said, suffer little children, come unto me. We believe that here, and we want to encourage that, and so we praise God for that. Yes, as our, as our uh, praise team is making their way up, and choir as well, uh, and just know that that arch will be moved back forward at the end of the service, so after service, if... Oh, you're totally... It'll be back. Oh, okay. All right. Well, it might just stand right there. It's on the side. Anyway, it's, it's going to come back. I guess it was, in, it was a blocking the, the view of the choir. But uh, so you know that you can take some pictures if you would like with your family right here. Also, just know that um, on our church grounds, we're very uh, blessed to have beautiful church grounds from the, the fence on this side going all the way to the fence on that side. Uh, that you can just go anywhere. If you see some place that you think looks like a nice place to have a picture with your family, feel free to do that as well, okay? You just want to make sure that you're aware of that. Uh, we want to encourage you to make as many fond memories of today as possible uh, with you and your family. It's not every day we get everybody dressed up in their Easter Sunday best, right? Especially the kids. So we definitely want to do that. Amen. So here we are, church. Amen. Let's, please, please stand if you can. Please stand if you can, sir. My mic wasn't on. <laughs> Forgive me in my voice this morning. From the grave he arose, with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, 
You may be seated.
just do the black and we'll thank you congregation choir praise team for singing thank you brother Andy for that all right well good morning again good to see each and every one of you here if you have your Bibles you can find first Corinthians chapter 15 this is just going to be sort of an introduction at this, uh, at this uh, passage here. Um, we have been in a uh, What the Resurrection Means to Us series uh, for a couple of Sundays now. And uh, so we're continuing in that because it's Resurrection Sunday. Amen. But there is so much to cover. And we're obviously not even going to cover it all in the series, but we're going to touch on some main things as we make our way through this series. And... Um, and I hope and pray that the Lord blesses you in and through it. Um, it is a blessing to me to be able to, to preach it. There are some things that I am absolutely convinced of and confident of. And one of those is the written word of God. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that that's what we hold in our hands uh, and that uh, God has made sure. But I'm also convinced in the living word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm absolutely convinced that he died and that he rose again, bodily rose again for you and for me. And uh, Lord willing, we'll touch on some things uh, that hopefully if you aren't convinced of that, you'll be convinced by the time we're done. Uh, there are many smart people in the world 
who have uh, doubted it, who have researched it, uh, who went by a formal name called a former name called atheist that now wear a new name called Christian. And that's because there's so much evidence, overwhelming evidence to the truth of the person of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection that these folks went out and found on their own. Thankfully, they had an open mind and were able to discover that what he said is true. Amen. And the resurrection really proves that any and everything that Jesus said is true and will come to pass. So uh, we'll hopefully see some of that as we go through this morning. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Father, we humbly again approach your throne. Father, we do so through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You tell us that because of that we can come humbly yet boldly. And so we as your children do that this morning. I'm praying, God, for you to have your will and your way in this service. I'm praying that everything that I do and say brings glory and honor to you and to you alone. Father, we seek to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ high this morning, and we pray, God, that if there be anyone here, uh, Lord, that doesn't know you in a real and personal way, Father, uh, it's possible that you have people who, who think that they've done something in the past, but their life hasn't changed, uh, Father, that could be here, and we pray, God, that, that, that your spirit pricks their heart and draws them. Uh, to, to a real saving faith. Father, if there's others here who may know, they may say, I don't believe this, uh, Father, but they're here. Uh, Lord, that's your grace that has brought them here. And so we pray, God, that before the service is over and before it's eternally too late, that they'll come to their senses and come to saving faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Lord, we pray, I pray, God, that you'll bless this time for your uh, honor, for your glory, and for your purpose. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so the basis really of our, of our uh, series here, I've been reading uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. Uh, I may actually read all the way up through verse 11 today. Uh, but uh, So beginning in verse 1, if you're there, it says this, Moreover, brethren, now this is Paul, he's writing to the Corinthian church or the church in Corinth, and he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you. Now the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's his life, death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel that Paul has been preaching. He says, which I uh, preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you you are saved. Uh, we used saved, born again, uh, coming to faith in Jesus Christ. These things we use interchangeably. By which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain. And what that means there is it's possible to believe without a, a effect. Some people make a mental assent. Some people make an emotional decision and then their life isn't truly changed. And then they go off and they think they're born again and they're saved and they live as if God doesn't exist. If that's your description of your life today, I would tell you that I don't believe you got saved. I don't believe you got born again. Uh, because whatever it is you believe was without effect. And I'm convinced that if you meet the risen Lord Jesus Christ, there will be an effect on your life. Amen. All right, well, let's go on. I'm getting a little distracted here. Uh, verse uh, number three, Paul says, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I re also received, that Christ died for our sins. That's part of what we celebrate today and really every Sunday is we celebrate that Christ died paid for was the propitiation that is the divine substitute for our sin your sin and my sin some 2,000 years ago okay uh, and then he goes on he says for our sins according to the scriptures God planned it all out Easter or resurrection or whatever happened to Christ during the uh, with the Roman soldiers and the Jew Jewish leaders that did not catch God by surprise. It was not a tragedy, but it was a triumph over sin, death, hell, and the grave. All right? So according to the Scriptures, verse 4 says, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, just another name for Peter, then by the twelve. It goes on, it says, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Now, when Paul wrote this, some of these people were alive. Some of the people that, that saw Christ, some of the 500 that saw him alive, they were around when Paul wrote this. All right? It goes, it goes, like this. It goes also, 
of whom the greater part remain to the present. So the greater part of 500 people who had seen Jesus raised from the dead, seen the resurrected Lord at one time, the greater part of those folks were still alive when Paul wrote this. They could have said, if it wasn't true, they could have said, that's not true, I was there. But they didn't, because it's true. This is one of these things where skeptics have a very, very hard time, because one of the theories that people want to say about Jesus and the resurrection is that they hallucinated. 500 people do not hallucinate on the same thing at the same time. I promise you, okay? We know that. We'll touch on maybe one other uh, theory before we're done today. But anyway, let's see where where, where to left. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, of whom, I, I move my hand, <laughs> of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James uh, and then by all the apostles, okay? Then last of all, uh, he, that is Jesus, was seen by me, Paul referring to himself, also as one born out of due time, okay? Uh, Paul saw him on the road to Damascus, uh, but uh, going on, ver- he goes on in verse 9, he says, For I am the least, Paul speaking of himself, for I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. See, his name used to be Saul, and Saul was sold out for God, And what he did is he didn't believe about Jesus. And so he was persecuting the Christians. And he was chasing them from town to town to arrest them. And God got a hold of Saul on the road to Damascus and changed his name to Paul. And Paul became a prolific defender of the faith. Oh my, did he ever. But he never lost his humility. He didn't forget where he came from. Verse 10, he goes on, he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was, within, which was with me. Uh, therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Amen. All right, amen. My hope and prayer is, is that everyone here believes and believes in such a way that it makes a difference in your life uh, with Jesus Christ. As we think about this, I, I, this is not on the slides right here, so we're in a good spot. I'm calling this kind of an introduction. It's kind of a reminder about some things. Uh, over in the book of Acts, beginning in, in chapter 1, verse 1 through uh, 3, says this. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus. So Luke is writing here, Uh, He wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote Acts. And so here he is saying that he's writing now to Theophilus uh, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. That's after he was resurrected, okay? And it says, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So after Jesus was resurrected, he, was pre- he presented himself on the earth to people for over a period of 40 days. One of those periods was to 500 people at once. There were other times to the disciples. We're going to see some of those times as we go forward. But something to pick up on here, we describe the word of God sometimes as being infallible. And what we mean by that is that it is without error, okay? That there is no error in the Word of God. It is not fallible. It is infallible, okay? So here in Acts, oh, by the way, Luke was a doctor, and he's writing this out. And he says, by many infallible proofs, okay? Well, what's the word many mean? word many means a great number, much, extensive, amounting to a large but indefinite number many now what does the word infallible mean or infallible proofs in the greek it's together it means this convincing proof an extremely convincing factual evidence that helps establish the truth of something and in this case it's the resurrection many infallible proofs and this is where I already uh, alluded a little bit about atheists who, who investigate and they become Christians. One of those atheists was C.S. Lewis. Maybe you've heard of him. Another one was Josh McDowell, Sr. 
That's, he's, he's been in the faith for so long now, he's got a, an adult son that's a minister and a defender and apologist as well. But Josh McDowell Sr. was a lawyer, and he took his lawyer skills to the gospel. And he said, I'm going to investigate this and, and see if it's true or not. And he found out to the point that he said it's true, and he became a believer. And you can find his book out there. It's called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. All right? From his world of legal verdict. There's another man that comes to mind. That's Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was a legal investigative reporter. He also, after his wife came to faith, said, you know what? I'm going to debunk this, and I'm going to use my talents and abilities and disprove this. And he found overwhelming evidence and became a born-again Christian and defender of the faith. You can find multiple of his works. They start off with a case for, a case for faith, a case for the Creator, uh, as well as others. And I'll tell you another one that came to my mind. There was a lady who was in a lesbian relationship, and she was a, uh, uh, an Ivy League professor, and uh, that was her lifestyle, okay? But her talents, her abilities in that, in that school was to read a book and discover, do the chapters in the book equal make up a whole thing? So she said, you know what? I'm going to use my abilities and take on the Bible. And she started reading the Bible for hours a day. And she found out, yes, the one book, or actually the 66 books, do make up one whole one. She got saved out of that lifestyle, and today she's a pastor's wife. Rosaria Butterfield is her name, if you want to look her up, all right? And there is a long line and a long list of people who have come out of uh, lostness in very similar ways. We see people all the time, all right? So here's one thing to think about as well as we think about here are five key evidences. Now, you've heard me mention uh, Dr. Gary Habermas before. Uh, I was blessed to have him as a, a seminary professor. He is world renowned on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's writing, he writes multiple books. But one of the things he did that whether anybody, whoever it might be, that might have had something to do with, the, uh, with a proof or an evidence, whether they were a believer or not, it didn't matter to him. He's collecting all of this information, all of this evidence. He's also one of those guys that goes to different college campuses and debates the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, with uh, unbelievers, okay? Uh, he didn't get to do all that much some more, be, uh, that much because the evidence is really overwhelming and they're really not having very many uh, arguments, uh, very many ways to, know, to any longer to kind of, uh, I'm losing where I was headed with that. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, they're all getting debunked. All these, all these theories of how Jesus Christ couldn't have raised from the dead, they're all getting really debunked. Because as science moves forward, we really see that what the Bible says is true. But what Gary, Mass found, Gary Habermas found were these five things that skeptics believe or at least will agree to, okay? The first one is they believe that Jesus died by crucifixion. They don't argue that. They don't debate that. Which, in, 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 uh, uh, which assumes that Jesus Christ was a real person who lived and walked on this earth at one point. So he's a historical person, and they acknowledge that, all right? They also acknowledge that the disciples were convinced they had seen the risen Christ, and that they boldly proclaimed this is true. So those are two of the things that they agree to. One, another one is that they agree to the conversion of Paul, which I just described to you, Saul going from Saul to Paul. They agree that that took place. He was a historical person, okay? And these people can be uh, uh, um, documented outside of the Bible, all right? Uh, the fourth thing was the conversion of James. James was Jesus' brother, all right? There's some people out there who want to say Jesus didn't have any brothers or sisters. Scripture says he did, and one of those was James. James was not a believer until he saw his risen brother. Now, then he became a believer and pastor of the Jerusalem church. <laughs> okay? And then the last thing is the empty tomb. The tomb is empty. Oh, amen. <laughs> the tomb is empty, Christian. <laughs> Praise God. I tell you, it all rises and falls on that. 
All right. In fact, one, one quote I ran across was this. It said, the Gospels do not explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains the Gospels. Belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. I, I've shared with you before that back when I was a chaplain and and uh, serving out on my base, and we were having one of our meetings uh, in the office. This is just the chaplain corps office. So you had chaplains and chaplain assistants there, and one of the chaplain assistants asked this question, how do you know that you've got the right religion or right faith? It is this, the resurrection. That's how I know. Uh, and, I, and I told them there that, that day. All right, one of the uh, false teachings, one of the false... Uh, um, uh, stories uh, that they put out there uh, is a wrong tomb. That uh, when those ladies got up that morning after they had uh, uh, anointed Jesus' body the night before or two nights before, and they went to the to the tomb, that they went to the wrong tomb. Here are some things to think about why we know that that's not true. Because then that would mean that those Roman soldiers went to the wrong tomb to guard. Oh, by the way, that would mean that the angels went to the wrong tomb to announce his resurrection. <clears throat> you can start to see how it just kind of all falls apart uh, there. And the other thing, too, and you know what's, what is uh, uh, believed to this day uh, among our Jewish friends is that the disciples stole the body. Now, they made that story up, but the uh, Roman soldiers who were guarding the tomb were paid, we know this in the scriptures and elsewhere, they were paid to say this, and this is what they said. The disciples stole the body while we were sleeping. Now, I don't care if you sleep with your eyes open. We don't see when we sleep. Maybe it's just sleepwalk or whatever, but you know, not those. those who say. So even their story kind of betrays themselves, does it not? Yeah, I mean, so if you got any uh, Jewish friends you're trying to witness to and they bring that up, just say, you know, can we think about this? If they were asleep, how did they see? They didn't, all right? So we won't spend a whole lot of time on, on those kinds of things. All right, so now what it means, what the resurrection means to us. We've talked about some of this already. We saw where it is. It's, the, it's Christianity because without the resurrection, we would not have Christianity, okay? So now what we see is it means that we have proof that Jesus died. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to give you just a minute here. Um, here we go. I don't know whose that is, but we're going to steal it. <clears throat> Isaiah 53. What we're going to find here, I hope that you will see, is proof that sin has been punished. Now, I made reference to the Jews. God gave them uh, the law. He gave them things to do to make themselves temporarily right with God through an atonement, and that was through sacrificing animals. And, uh, and they, would, they would do that daily because they would sin daily, and they would see daily that, the, that sin is serious in God's eyes. That, in other words, it is death, right? We know over in Romans it tells us for the wages of sin is death, all right? Uh, and, and here we'll see so they had a very visual uh, object lesson going on all the time that God hates sin and sin is really bad. And we need to be reminded of that, I think, in our day and age. God hates sin, okay? Uh, Jesus died because of our sin. Amen, he did, okay? Your sin, my sin. Sin of the world, all right? Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 1, starts off. We, verse 5 is our focus. That's what we're going to look at. But it starts off with, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm, that is the strength of the Lord, been revealed? Uh, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He, and this is describing Christ. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows. Maybe you've got sorrows in your life. Jesus can relate. This is a description of him. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. All right? And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. 
Surely he has borne our griefs, carried them in other words, and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But, verse 5, in thinking about our sins, but he was wounded for our transgressions, okay? Yep, Jesus Christ was wounded, pierced for our transgression, for our sin, in other words, for our crime. Jesus was wounded for you and for me, all right? Not only that, it says he was bruised, or that is crushed, for our iniquities, again, for our sin. Now, I assume by now that many, if not everyone, has seen that movie that uh, Mel Gibson put out, uh, I'm, uh, The Passion, thank you, I was about to say, I'm forgetting that. But that's the closest depiction that I've seen Hollywood come to as to the pain and suffering that Jesus Christ went through. And if you might remember, his whole body was, was basically had uh, tears on it from the cat of nine tails. And, and I think that's, I don't, it's, it's close, but I think it was really worse even for Jesus. Because Satan was having his time with the Son of God, and he was making it bad. Uh, in fact, Scripture tells us he was hardly recognizable as a man. Um, so we, and that's just the physical pain that he endured for you and for me and for our sin. Uh, there's spiritual pain, I believe, also. Uh, that's why he cried out, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani, on the cross, when he was on the cross, which is translated says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's because God could not look on sin. And when our sin was put on him, God had to turn away the first and only time in all of eternity past and all of eternity future that God was separated from his uniquely begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just can't imagine the pain that was there as a result of that in a spiritual sense. We don't get it. But we should be very thankful that Jesus did and does. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised or crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement or discipline uh, for our peace was upon him so that we could be made whole. And that's what he goes on and says there in verse, uh, as it continues on. And by his stripes, uh, we are healed. Those stripes are the things I was talking about, that cat of nine tails. You know, it's that leather whip that had multiple pieces coming out of it. And in the leather, they would embed pieces of bone or glass or metal. They would put that in there so that as when it would hit. And man, I'll tell you what, those Romans, they were good at killing people. They knew when people were dead. They knew how to bring them to the edge of that without finishing them off to in inflict the most pain as possible. You've heard the word excruciating. It's probably not new to you that that's where we get our word excruciating from is from the cross. If you've ever caught yourself saying, man, that pain was excruciating, you just made a reference to the cross. He did that for you and for me. Those stripes. Man, just getting whipped over and over again. Horrible, horrible thing to think. Verse 6 goes on and says, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, Yahweh, that is God, has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Now we know in this church that all, more often than not, means all. <laughs> it means in its entirety. Uh, and we'll see that too, because uh, we're going to get there. I'm not going to stop until we're done. All right, all right, so all right, so the Lord has laid that on, on Jesus. That is proof, I mean, this is prophecy prior to the cross happening, so, and this happened to Jesus, and no one else has paid this way. He has fulfilled uniquely these prom prophecies of God, promises of God, that one day, our, and, and he paid for our sin. We'll see that, all right? I think we see that there. Not only it means uh, that we have proof that Jesus died, but also this proof is by his broken body. Turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. The gospel's there. Proof of his broken body. How can we prove that? I'm going to pick up in verse 24. John chapter 20. Picking up in verse 24, Brother Tracy was in the earlier part of John 20 in Sunday school, and we just felt like that was God uh, working it out, where he got the front end, and I'm getting the back end. 
<laughs> Amen. Beginning in verse 24, it says this, now Thomas called the twin. Now, many times we hear Thomas, he's called doubting Thomas, okay? But uh, if we were in that situation, we might not be any better than him. So let's not uh, beat up on Thomas too much. But Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, can I, can I tell you that what the, the commentaries say, we don't know why Thomas wasn't there. Um, there's no you know, reason or whatever. But can I tell you what kind of hit me this morning on that? Was you don't want to miss church. Right. See? <laughs> Thomas, you know, clearly the disciples were gathered, okay? They were gathered and Jesus showed up. And Thomas wasn't there, and he missed out. All right? He missed out. So we'll see. Thomas corrects his behavior in just a minute. All right? Hang with me. I'm just throwing that out there that I think it's important. Because one thing that we don't know, and I don't think the disciples knew then either, is we never know when Jesus is going to show up. And when he's going to show up and show out. But I'll tell you what. You, if you're not here, you miss. If you're not in the gathering, sometimes he shows up in Sunday school. Sometimes it is Sunday night or Wednesday night. Uh, you know, and he can bring revival whenever he chooses to, even though we schedule it like next weekend, Friday night, starting Friday night at 7, Saturday night at 6, and Sunday morning at 11, we've got a spring revival. Please come back and, uh, and hear from my dear friend, Steve Thompson. He was a pastor of Crown Point Baptist Church for 20 years, not in the too distant past, all right? So please come back. But, uh, but it's important to make you, see, just like that, Friday night, you're going to have to make a decision where you want to be. It's going to be your decision. I'm not going to force you, and God's not going to force you. But if you don't come here and Jesus shows up, you miss out. I'd almost go so far as to say that the less you're in church, the less you believe. Because Thomas wasn't in, he wasn't in the gathering, and we'll see, he had, he didn't believe at first. All right? So verse 25 goes on and says, The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. They're witnessing to Thomas. So he said to them this. He said, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, which is really more so in the wrist. Uh, he says, If I put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. There may very well be people here like that this morning. You can't prove God to me, and because of that, I won't believe. You're not alone. Thomas was that way. He said right there, I will, that's a, to me, you could point right there at that and say that's why the Bible's true. Because anybody, if a man was writing this story, he probably would have left that out, along with a whole lot of other things throughout Scripture. But God didn't do that. He includes things for a purpose. And one of those purposes is because we can relate to Thomas. There's probably a time in your life when you could relate to Thomas. And he said, I will not believe. And then after eight days, his disciples were again inside. And Thomas with them, going on verse 26, Jesus came. He showed up again. The doors being shut, and he stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Man, he just showed up. Boom. He doesn't have to, at this point, it's his resurrected body. He didn't have to come through the door. By the way, he still doesn't have to come through the door. <laughs> He is the door, but he doesn't have to come through it, all right? Uh, he says, peace to you. And look, he meets people right where they are. Uh, he turned to Thomas. Look, he said, verse 27, he said, he, then he said to Thomas, see, he knew. There's no disciple tattling on Thomas somewhere. Jesus knows it all. He knows everything in your life and my life. Don't kid yourself. There is nothing new under the sun, and there is nothing that the sun doesn't see or know, all right? And he knew it, and so he comes to Thomas. Reach here, your finger here, and look in my hands. Reach your hand here and put it on my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And that's one encouragement I would say to you if you're here and you've never truly trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Be believing. Jesus saying it right there. Now, look at Thomas's thing. He says next, and Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Thomas changed in an instant. Okay? He sure did. All right, going on in verse 29. Look what Jesus, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen 
and yet have believed. Okay? So you can be blessed there with that. Oh my, what a loving Lord we have. Let's go on to our next point here. What the resurrection means to us, it means we have proof that Jesus died. And I, I don't even have to move my pages because I'm in John chapter 19 for this, as you can see right there. I'm going to pick up in verse 28. Verse 28 in John chapter 19, it says this, After this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, okay, to put us in context, Jesus is on the cross, all right? And if you see the verses just ahead of that, he has looked at John, and he has looked at Mary, his mother, and he has basically put Mary under John's care and said, this is your mother now, all right? It's a beautiful thought there. While he's in this excruciating pain on the cross, he still takes care of others. <clears throat> but verse 28, he says, after this, after that, okay, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, he knows uh, the scripture, uh, he knows everything's accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled now, he says, I thirst, okay? Uh, and now a vessel of full wire, uh, wine was sitting there, and, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a hyssop and put it up, uh, put it to his mouth, Okay? So one of the, the terrible things about the crucifixion or that method of death is not only the pain that you're going through by hanging from nails that are in your wrists and in your feet, and in addition to the scourging and the beating that he took, uh, but there's a tremendous thirst that comes. And, uh, and that is, that's one of the things that's just really horrible about the crucifixion. All right? So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Amen. Now, some of us know what that means. And that little word, it, <laughs> is, means a whole lot. But this is actually one word in the Greek. It's tetelestai. Maybe you've heard of that before. And what it means is paid in full. Now, I've explained this before. We are here in present time 2024, March 31st, 2024, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. I don't care what anybody else might claim it is today. It is Resurrection Easter Sunday, and we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord today. And I'd encourage you not to celebrate anything else, all right? Uh, but this is present day, all right? This side is all the past. From today, going all back, all throughout history, all throughout the sum, what is it, eight or nine, ten thousand years, if you ask me. All right, this side is all the future, the eternity into the future. And on that, on that present day, when Jesus was on the cross and he said, It is finished, Tetelestai, paid in full, he is talking about all of man's sin past present future paid some 2000 years ago paid in full now if you had somebody if you've ever been one of these fortunate people that's had this happen to you i don't think you would go and, and offer more money but if you've had your walmart layaway paid off by somebody you're not going to go try and give more money to walmart are you y'all act like you hadn't heard of that if it's paid in full, well, you're not going to go give Walmart any more of your money. Right. Many of us probably don't like giving Walmart what we give them anyway, but that's a whole other topic. Anyway, <laughs> but the idea is it's an accounting term, and when it's paid in full, first of all, we can't pay any more. We can't pay anything to it. Oh, I heard somebody say, I saw a preacher that said this, said if we could lose our salvation, we would. Oh, you need to chew on that a minute, don't you? Another pastor that said, if 0.01% of salvation depended on you and me, we'd be lost. It's another way of saying that, okay? It's true. Oh, did I not? I didn't share that, did I? I meant to share this in Isaiah when we were talking about that. Here's what it is, all right? God says in Isaiah 64, 6, he says, but we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Well, we know that's true because it's Scripture. But it begs the question, if our righteousness is filthy rags, 
what must our sin be? Man, that's why we can't do anything to save ourselves. And that if we could lose our salvation, we would, if you were genuinely born again. That's the thing. That's the key. That's why I get away from once saved, always saved. What I say, if you're truly saved, then you're always saved. Because I'm convinced if you're born again, you can't be unborn. Just like people. It's one of those physical things that God uses that can represent the spiritual as well. And Jesus says you must be born again. Now those of us that have been present at a birth, and you've been present at least at your own, you can't be unborn. <laughs> okay? But the, but the thing is that there's so many people who believe without effect that we've got all these people running around saying, I'm Christian, I'm Catholic, I'm whatever, and there's no difference in their life. They only come to church on Christmas, Easter, and maybe other special occasions. But outside of that, God, I don't have time for you. Oh, but by the way, I know that when I die, I'm going to go from here to you because of something I said or did way back when. But in between now and then, there's no relationship. I'll tell you what, people who do their marriages this way, they don't last. The marriage will not last. If you're not home, if you're not communicating, if you're not having interaction, if you're not committed to it, if you're not investing in it, Ah, goodness. <laughs> yeah, right, brother. Tell them. I forgot where I was going now. It is finished. <laughs> we can't, there's nothing that we can do for our sin and our salvation. Jesus Christ has done it all. And I look at it this way. There's nothing that Gary can do, as hard as I might try, that would compare basically to the gospel. In other words, the good news that Jesus Christ lived a perfect, sinless life. There's nothing Gary can do that can compare to that. It doesn't matter how much I put in the offering plate. It doesn't how much, matter how much I serve God. Um, it doesn't matter about those things. None of those things will, can compare to that perfect life that Jesus Christ lived and then going to the cross, having my sin, your sin, world sin placed upon him and paying for that for you and for me and then rising again from the dead bodily three days later. There's nothing, I, I don't know about you, can, I can't think of anything that a human can do to compare with that. Nothing. But if you're truly born again, I can't think of anything that a human can do that can undo that. That's just me, but I'm happy. It might be my little world, but I'm happy in it. It is God's grace to tell us that once we are saved, man, nothing can separate us from his love. Amen. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what being born again means. It means that we are now in Christ Jesus. And there is no condemnation. Tell that to the devil next time he beats you up with your sin, okay? All right. He says, after this, knowing that all things have been, uh, were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And verse 29 goes on, it says, now a vessel of uh, fi flew with sour water sitting there, and they filled it, uh, put it on a hyssop, they put it up to his mouth, I guess I read that. Uh, so when he had, uh, well, goodness, I started back over, didn't I? Um, we must need this again. I'll read it one more time. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Now look what he did. He bows his head, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit, okay? Now what that means is no man takes his life, but he lays it down. I'm convinced that those Roman soldiers, they knew Jesus was different, not only that after he did this and what happened going on around, but because of just the whole process, he was different. And I'm convinced that my Lord, when he was laying down, and they were banging those uh, nails through his hands, was not struggling with them. I saw an image that looked like it had a Roman soldier holding the arm of Jesus down while he was having his nails. I don't believe that's accurate. I think it stunned them because he went, here you go. Here you go. You're not taking it from me. I'm laying it down. I am willingly giving it for you and for me. If you ever think God doesn't love you, don't let the devil steal that from you. 
Be reminded, he does. God loves you. All right? Verse 31 goes on, therefore, because it was the preparation day, the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate uh, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. Those two thieves that were with him were still alive. Jesus gives up his ghost, the spirit, and he's dead. The other ones were still alive. So to speed that along, to help, in other words, to suffocate them, even more painfully, they broke those legs of those folks. All right? But when they came to Jesus, verse 33, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now, be reminded again, these Romans knew how to kill people, and they also knew when people were dead. There was no mistake. Because probably if they made a mistake, they'd be crucified. All right? Because if they fell asleep at the, at, at, on duty, such as watching the, the, uh, the tomb, and they fell asleep, they'd be killed. Roman soldiers didn't fall, don't, never fell asleep on the job, all right? But anyway, that's an aside. So, uh, so they did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his uh, side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. This is one of these things in our day and age that medical science can look at and say, yes, that's an accurate description. Probably throughout the, some, two, uh, yeah, we're nearly uh, 2,000 years that this has been written, uh, you probably had people in the past not understanding. They might understand blood coming out, but they wouldn't necessarily understand why water would be coming out. And, and we, knew, we know now that there's a water sack around the, the heart, and that's a very accurate description of what would take place. All right? So they knew that Jesus died. All right? So we've seen that now. Now I want us to move into what I'm going to call the invitation. Excuse me, I'm a bit uh, <clears throat> dried up there. The invitation. This is a time that we set aside in the service that maybe after you hear the message, maybe even during the message, you know, you can't explain. There's a, there's a drawing, uh, you know, that, that you just feel drawn to come forward. You don't know why that is. And maybe you've never trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Uh, this is a time of the service where we, uh, where we set aside so that we can do what we call do business with God. Save people. Many times we get touched to come forward and pray. Uh, maybe there's something in your life you need to confess to the Lord. You can do that down here uh, where there's been a, a, a long, wonderful legacy of many saints coming and praying uh, to the Lord here. Uh, but that's what part of what it's also the time when you come and you share with us that you've uh, come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. It's also the time where you come and you say, you know what, I'm a believer. I've been baptized by immersion. I want to join the church. Uh, that, this invitation, it covers all of that. And you can see I've got some scripture up there, but they're just a couple of verses. Now I want to read these verses as we are into this invitation. And then we're, they're going to be singing while we're standing. And I'm praying that we're all praying that you allow God, you don't worry about what time it is. It's 1206, okay? Um, it's Easter Sunday. Uh, there are probably a lot of churches that are running past 12. <laughs> all right but we're almost done okay so don't don't miss out on some of this because it's it's important i i saved some of these verses for now john chapter 20 verses 30 and 31 says this and this is in reference to the gospel of john that we've been reading here in fact it may be still open on your on your uh on your bible there if you still have that open to john uh, and it says this and truly jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, okay? Uh, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Christos means Messiah. So in other words, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, okay? The Son of God, it goes on, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Amen. If you don't believe, you're, not, you're spiritually dead. You don't have life. John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26 says this, Jesus, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me, in Jesus Christ, shall never die. And he asked this question right at the end of that, do you believe this? Amen. That's the question everybody in this, under the sound of my voice, whether you're in the, the nursery, online, whether the case might be, do you believe this? I hope and pray you do. Let me share one other uh, 
a couple of verses, and then we'll go into the invitation. This is out of Acts chapter 17. They didn't know I was going to share this. Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, um, says this, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Repent means agree with God that whatever the sin is in your life, that that was sin, you were wrong and he was right, and you're going to, you are turning around and you're not going to do it anymore. You're repenting, okay? All people everywhere should repent because, verse 31, he has a, he has fixed a day. There's a day coming that God has fixed. In other words, it's in the future, but he has fixed it. And it says, in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, capital M. That's a reference to Jesus Christ, okay? Whom he has appointed. He appointed Jesus unto this. And he goes on, and it finishes up with this. Having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead all right god has provided proof and it's the proof is so solid that they don't even debate it anymore in academia on college campuses because it's overwhelming proof jesus christ rose bodily from the dead and because of that everything else he said is true and we have that blessed hope not only that he's coming back for us but that those that are believers we're going to rise with him one day again as well amen amen let's pray father we pray that you have your will and your way during this time of invitation lord and pray that uh that uh, nothing in our lives will hinder the working of your spirit this morning, God. We pray that you move and just have your will. We love you, Lord. I pray we love each other. And Father God, we ask all of this now for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand if you can, as we have a time of invitation. darkness 
into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that calls praise offering. Amen. Thank you, praise team, for that wonderful rendition. Um, uh, just real quick, some announcements and some presentations. Uh, so no choir practice tonight and no services this evening. We want to have that time. I want you to have that time with your families uh, today. We see some are in, from out of town and maybe some other family and also great for that. Don't forget again, just uh, this coming Friday, there's, there's just going to be Wednesday service between now and then uh, about the revival. Friday night, 7 p.m., six, Saturday night, 6 p.m., and then uh, this time frame on the Sunday morning, next Sunday morning uh, and all. So trying to do a little bit earlier time on Saturday, um, figuring that most people probably don't have to rush home from work and uh, we'll have more light for some of those folks that might have concerns about the darkness and all. So... Uh, and then the following Friday will be Prime Timers, and uh, so there'll be more information for that group. Prime Timers is a ministry uh, of our uh, 16 up, and so I encourage uh, any and all to attend. They have a wonderful time, food, fellowship, singing, uh, and uh, scripture, so it's a good thing. All right, we've got a couple of presentations to make, so if uh, uh, Mike and Mary, if you'll come up. Oh, I got bottle water bottles everywhere now <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh they almost don't need uh, i think uh, introduction but i'll introduce them nonetheless uh, mike and mary white have been uh, coming for quite some time now and uh, god has led them to join our fellowship here they are both amen praise the lord we're very thankful for how god has worked in their life and uh, they're always very encouraging on their way out to me and that's such, such a blessing so Stay up here if you, if you don't mind, as our folks will come by and greet and, and love on you. Oh, by the way, I guess I should say this, since they're coming for membership. All those in favor, say amen. 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 All right, and it carries, amen. And then come on up, Jude and parents, Mike and Aaron. Amen. Again, a family that doesn't need uh, introduction, um, but uh, this young man here comes forward uh, sharing that God has saved him and has, amen. We've seen God working on Jude for quite some time, um, and uh, here's something that I think you should know if you don't already know about him. 
I have almost run out of tracks in my office, tracks that we hand out, because he keeps coming back asking for tracks, and he hands those out at school and other places. And God is using him even at nine years old, right? He's, uh, and so, amen, right? We praise the Lord for your decision. If you're excited about how God's working in Jews' life, would you say amen or give the Lord a praise offering and shout amen? We're going to ask if y'all would stay up here as well so that uh, everyone can come by and love on you, brother, okay? And I can call you brother now because we're brothers in, in the Lord. Amen. You still call him pastor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> Brother uh, Winston, I'm wondering if you'll close us in a word of prayer. Amen.
Bye. 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 Bye.